Our fate is in our hands. And in our hands, we have the power to make things better for the Jewish people and all people on earth. We are the World Jewish Congress. Founded in 1936, we've been here for the Jewish people ever since. We were the first organization to warn the world of the Nazis' final solution. We stood on the front lines, caring for survivors and rebuilding the foundations of Jewish life after the Holocaust. We supported the founding of a Jewish state. And in the years since, we've never shied away from taking on challenges facing Jews around the world, working to aid Soviet Jewry and establishing relations with the Catholic Church. This is our past, but we live in the present and must look to the future. And we're here to continue our mission, motivated by our deep traditions and the vision of Theodor Herzl. Today, there's only one organization that brings the Jewish people together to speak with one voice, the World Jewish Congress. We bring together Jewish communities from more than 100 countries. Through WJC NextGen and our Jewish Diplomatic Corps, we are taking action and empowering the voices of emerging Jewish leaders. We continue to preserve the memory of the Holocaust through projects like the We Remember campaign and AboutHolocaust.org. The next generation should know what we went through, and it should never happen again. And through strong partnerships with critical allies such as UNESCO and the European Union, we are reaching millions to ensure that the lessons of the past can be used to build a better future for all. We protect the rights of Jews to freely practice their religion, while at the same time forging bonds with leaders of different faiths and nationalities. We do this so we can stand united in the face of extremists and white supremacy. We do this so we can fight back against the waves of hate directed at the world's only Jewish state, Israel. And we do this so we may take on the BDS movement, which increasingly threatens Jewish students. Make no mistake, the BDS movement doesn't support the Palestine people. It is strictly a campaign to delegitimize Israel, which is simply the latest attempt to deny the Jewish people the right of self-determination. In a new era, we must also take our fight to those who spread hate online. We've worked with the world's largest social media companies, including Meta and TikTok, to improve their policies and share reliable information so no one can deny or distort the Holocaust. And today, we've used these same platforms to galvanize the world, raising millions for refugees impacted by the war in Ukraine. Why do we do this? Because this is our purpose. This is our way. Because a better world is possible. We will make it a reality. Please welcome the President of the World Jewish Congress, Ambassador Ronald Lauder. Good evening. On behalf of my co-chairs, Shella Safra and David the Rothschild, I want to welcome you to the 11th Annual World Jewish Congress Theodor Herzl Awards Gala. Our first Herzl Award winner was Shimon Peres in 2012. The first Teddy Kalik Award winner uh, went to Kurt Douglas in 2016. Tonight, we celebrate and honor two great men, both of whom had defended the Jewish people, but in very different ways. There is so much to say about Reuven Rivlin, the 10th president of the State of Israel his lifelong commitment to the Jewish state and to the Jewish people around the world. He has done many, many things during a challenging moment in Israel's politics. Ruben Rivlin's positive voice, his optimism, and his spirit has been a reminder of the profound hope and vision of the Jewish people and the Jewish state that welcomes all people all religions, all ethnic groups. From his earliest work in the Knesset through his presidency, Reuben Rivlin represents the very best of Israel leadership. I have a personal story about Reuben Rivlin that I believe says so much about him. In 2018, I held the annual World Jewish Hanukkah party for the UN ambassadors and diplomats at the Pierre Hotel. President Rivlin joined us. 
and he arranged for have a group of Israeli Jews and Palestinians sing for the guests. They sang some Hanukkah songs and some Arab songs, some songs that brought us all together as human beings, not as members of different groups. This created a rare electricity that was unusual for a diplomatic gathering. And for a long time after, when I would run into some of these ambassadors who were there, they brought this up to me and said that they said they gave them a different view of Israel. Reuben Rivlin is a man who, by his example, brings people together. And that night at the pier, he reminded us that Israelis and Palestinians can live together in peace. Our other awardee, Ken Burns, is not one of the best documentary filmmakers. He is the best, period. His most recent work in the U.S. Um, and says the U.S. and the Holocaust. It is the most difficult to watch, but because of that, it is his most important film, I believe. For the first time ever, Americans have been given an honest look at what this country did and did not do in the 1930s and 40s for European Jews who were begging for a place to emigrate. During their greatest hour of needs, America slammed its doors shut to Jews, in part because of German influence at that time, but mostly because of anti-Semitism right here in the United States. The hatred and fear of Jewish people in the 1930s was right there in the open. And it made it impossible, Franklin Roosevelt, to allow any more Jewish refugees on our shores. People feared they would lose their jobs during the 1930s to these Jews coming in. In the summer of 1938, when the world could no longer ignore what was happening to the Jews in Germany and Austria, the U.S. sponsored an international conference in Evian, France. Every representative condemned Germany. There were heartfelt speeches and very moving. But because Franklin Delano Roosevelt was told he would lose his re-election if he let Jews in, the U.S. representative stood up at the conference and said America would not change its quarters, which were minuscule. And every country followed suit. Hitler saw that, and he said, and he understood its meaning. It could not have been more clear. No one else cared about the Jewish people either. I believe if America had opened its doors to Jews, other countries would have followed. And more importantly, Hitler might have not taken the steps he took, the industrialized murder of millions. We will never know what might have happened, but we do know this. Americans' action sealed their fate. Four months later, on November 9, 1938, Hitler challenged the world again with Kristallnacht, which we'll see in the film. It's important to note that once again, there was little or no world reaction. On November 14th, 1938, five days after that, Hitler said, we can do with the Jews what we want to do. The world doesn't care. Kristallnacht was the star of the Holocaust. I have said this before, right after World War II, after the world saw the photos of the camps and the ovens, nobody in their right mind wanted to be associated with Nazis. But today, 78 years and three generations later, we hear the same lies. But this one with a great difference. Today's hatred of Jews has its focus on one target, the world's only Jewish state, Israel. And they are using a new weapon. Since 1948, Israel's, Israel's enemies could not defeat it 
militarily. They could not defeat it economically, and they tried. But now they are succeeding in undermining Israel politically, and they are concentrating their efforts on education in high schools, colleges, and universities to turn the next generation, even Jewish students, against Israel. Today, their lies are working right into this growing anti-Semitism. It comes from the political right as well as the political left. It is for this reason that I called an emergency meeting early this afternoon uh, with Shalit Safra, who was there, and a meeting. The World Jewish Congress will now devote all of its efforts on education and fighting this new wave of anti-Semitism on campuses. The political war in Israel is playing out internationally as well to turn Israel into a pariah state. Russia attacks Ukraine. Iran spreads, spreads terror abroad. North Korea threatens the world with nuclear weapons. Syria slaughters 500 of its own people. But no one ever says Russia, Iran, North Korea, and Syria have no right to exist. Only Israel's legitimacy is questioned every single day, particularly in the UN. Let me be clear, perfectly clear. This is not anti-Zionism. This is anti-Semitism. And don't let anyone tell you it isn't. This is the same old hatred of Jews we have seen for 2,000 years. It just comes in from people, from a different way that people can accept. Combine that with Ken Burns' documentary film that we are seeing today, and that should make us all very uneasy. Just as the German Bunds worked here in America in the 1930s, and they ignited anti-Semitism here in America. Today, anti-Semitism is coming from the Middle East, combined with homegrown anti-Semitism. They are trying to undermine US support for the only democracy in the Middle East, Israel. And it's just like Evian. If the US were ever to abandon its support for Israel, you can bet what the, the other people in the world would follow. Israel will be truly alone. We cannot and must not let that happen again. The World Jewish Congress was founded in 1936 during the dark night. I tried and failed. It tried and failed to warn the world of the danger coming from Nazi Germany. Today, this organization is fighting the same fight. The people who hate us have different names but it's the same fight. Sometimes I feel like we are fighting all alone. That is why our work is so important and your support is absolutely vital. I can't begin to tell you enough how you being here and caring for us is so important to us. Tonight you will hear from the two awardees. You will see portions of Ken Burns' documentary. You will hear from a previous Herzl Award winner, who was also a refugee from Nazi Germany, Dr. Henry Kissinger. And there is much more. You will hear this song that all of you know, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, sung by the children of Talon. And let me tell you, what you may not know is that song deeply touched millions of people in Europe and many of the people who were going to concentration camps heard that song with the words of hope when there was very little hope. And they always sang it in different languages. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I heard once in a lullaby. And finally, at your tables later, you will find a very special gift, the new cookbooks from the recipes of Auschwitz survivors, four of whom are with us here tonight, Tova Friedman, Eugene Ginter, Louis Flamholz, Louis Flamholz and, me, and Michael Bornstein. And, uh, <laughs> and our dinner tonight comes right from these recipes. I've tried some, they work.
except for the matzo bari that comes out too ugh. I hope none of the survivors gave me the recipe. Um, and also, we have the latkes of a formal Herzl Award winner, Elian, Eli, Eli, Eli Wiesel, and he and Marion um, were also Herzl winners. Um, by the way, this is the only time I've ever heard latkes without onions, because Ellie didn't like onions. Your, your, your dinner should make you feel right at home on Friday night. So tonight, we reflect, we celebrate, and we enjoy all the things that we are so grateful to have. Let me finally say, with everything the World Jewish Congress is doing, we could not do any of it without your help. I thank you for being here, thank you for your support, and I thank you for helping make a difference defending the Jewish people. God bless you. I saw uniformed people at a store where the glass was broken. We see our neighbors grabbing the things from the store. The uniformed people stood in the door and watching it and laughing and having a good time. I'm Margot Friedland. I was born in Berlin on the 5th of November, 1921. I was on my way to work in the morning. And when I came down, I felt that it, the air is not the same as usual. The synagogues were burning. Everybody was up, and everybody knew what happened already. On November 9th and 10th, 1938, the Nazis launched a series of attacks against Jews in Germany and Austria. During Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, more than 7,000 Jewish homes, businesses, and synagogues were burned and destroyed. Nearly 100 Jews were murdered that night, and about 30,000 Jewish men were taken to concentration camps, including Dachau, Sachsenhausen, and Buchenwald. The event marked a turning point in the persecution and attempted annihilation of the Jewish people at the hands of the Nazis. We felt Germans. We felt we belong here. Margo was born and raised in a Jewish family in Berlin. Her father, mother, and brother were all murdered in the gas chambers. Margot's story is just one of millions who endured the horrors of the Holocaust, had their families decimated, and whose dreams and futures were tarnished forever. I don't understand that humans could give their hand to, for something like this so many. How was it possible that Millions could do that. With the number of survivors dwindling each year, we must listen to their stories and transmit them to future generations so they're never forgotten. I said to the young students, you are about the same age like my brother. He didn't have the chance that you have to have a chance. These millions didn't have a chance. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the presentation of the 11th annual World Jewish Congress Theodore Herzl Award. Together, all humanity share a common future. And we must work to try to shape it together. To be a great leader, one must illuminate the future while honoring the past. Azikaron, a history, metzave aleinu loosif, lilmod.
This is how Reuven Ruby Rivlin, the 10th president of the state of Israel, has spent his life. Born in 1939 in Jerusalem, before the founding of the modern state, he has dedicated his life to the Jewish people, from defending Israel in the Six-Day War to serving as the country's 10th president, a presidency that saw the first peace deal signed between Israel and an Arab country in over 25 years, and a continued commitment to strengthening Israel's relationships with leaders and critical partners around the world. Israel and Germany Shaped by his family's great legacy, one that has continued a tradition of Zionist scholars and leaders and has called Jerusalem their home for over 200 years, Ruby Rivlin has served the state of Israel with honor and love for all of Israel's citizens, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, and all others. We must build together a tikva, a shared hope for Israel, for our shared future in this land. And he has constantly worked to strengthen Jewish communities across the globe and solidify their bonds with the state of Israel. All our Jewish brothers and sisters, we are all one family. Today, we honor not just a great leader, we honor a father, a grandfather, and a friend. He is truly deserving of our highest honor, the World Jewish Congress's Theodore Herzl Award. Toda Ruby. Ruvi. It's now my great honor to present to Ruben Revelin with this year's World Jewish Congress Theodore Herzl Award. David Ben-Gurion has been called the founding father of Israel. I think that's true, but Reuben Rivlin, the 10th president, has sometimes been called Israel's grandfather, a warm, loving, strong political leader who is loved by everyone he knows, and luckily, many do. I now would like President Rivlin to come up and receive the Herzl Award. Thank you. Thank you. The Herzl Award is here, and we need four people to lift it. Why can't you? <laughs> Sorry. You want me to? No, don't, please. <laughs> Thank you so Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you, President Lauda, and thank you, Madam President Safa. Thank you, all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I bring you the blessing from Jerusalem because before everything, before being the president, before being a member of Knesset, before being a minister, I'm first of all a Jerusalemite, son of Jerusalemite, son of the son of Jerusalem, the rabbi, and son of the son of the son of, of, of a Jerusalemite. I'm descendant of the Vilna Gaon. The Hasidim should uh, really forgive me. And I brought you blessing from Jerusalem. As I've said before, my dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you for this great honor. Thank you for coming here tonight. God bless all of you. Theodore Benjamin Zev Herzl wrote, and I quote, let the sovereignty be granted us, the rest the rest we shall manage for ourselves. But, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, he was a little bit wrong. Sovereignty is not granted. It is earned. It is earned by rights. Yes, the Jewish people have an historical 
legal and moral right to sovereignty in our ancient homeland in Eretz Israel. But sovereignty must also be earned by responsibility. By the fact that we respect our rights as a sovereign nation to uphold the civil rights of all citizens in our state. The State of Israel, as Ron said, was built in 1948 according to two values that we all holding together. We holding those two values that Israel must be a Jewish democratic state, democratic and Jewish, Jewish and democratic, in one tongue and in one birth. Sometimes that put us in a kind of difficulties and maybe one day I will explain those difficulties but it will take us hours. But as former Chief Justice of, this, of the Supreme Court of Israel, Professor Aaron Barak would say even 120 members of the Knesset cannot change those two principles. Israel as a Jewish state and Israel as democracy. And my friends, sovereignty is earned by the fact that we work for a better future of all humanity with te technologies and innovations to help in the fight climate uh, change and to help um, uh, to bring food and water to all people around the world. And we are succeeding. We are succeeding very much. For example, one of my friends who lives now in New York uh, temporarily because he's not a Jerusalemite, but he's, he comes from Tel Aviv. Never mind, Tel Aviv is okay. <laughs> really, with the innovation of bringing uh, the, the use of electricity uh, to the whole world, a wireless charging of all um, uh, cars around the world. And Herzl. Herzl was right when he said, the rest we shall do for ourselves. Because he knew, he knew very well what the Jewish people were able to achieve. These people who were held in ghettos, as we have heard, and murdered in pogroms. And of course, tonight, we, are, we remember the Kristallnacht, as Ron said before. We remember and commemorate this terrible night, and we will never, ever forget, and I said so in the Bundestag. But, we, but even against all these challenges, Herzl knew our potential. Our potential. He had the great faith in the Jewish people. A faith I share with him, a faith I'm sure that all of you share too. It is this faith that has driven me forward. And it is this faith which I carried with me as I served in the IDF in the war of 67, releasing Jerusalem, and in 73, and in the first Lebanon war. I served in the army for more than 50 years as a reserve soldier because I went to the Hebrew University, the first Hebrew University ever. And now, when I was born, there were, at the land of Israel, only 250,000 Jews. And I dreamt at the time, when I was 10 years old, that in the year 2000, we will be 2 million Jews in Israel. Actually, in 2000, we were 6 million Jews, a terrible number. 
but such a really glorious number once we are talking about the state of Israel that was established in 1948. And uh, it is this faith in the Jewish people that I had as a member of uh, the Munich, Jerusalem Municipality. Afterwards, we will have the award on the name of Teddy Kolek. The Jerusalem Municipality, I helped Teddy Kolek, although being the head of the opposition, because I was from one party, uh, the Revisionist Party, the Jab I was a pupil of Jabotinsky, and Ben Gurion was from the Labour Party. Even as the leader of the opposition, I worked for Jerusalem and Mayor Teddy Kolek, who was one of the best mayors in the world. In fact, some people would call me the right hand of Teddy Kolek. And you know, they say, yeah, all around, they say there were two men who built Jerusalem after King David and King Solomon. And they were Herod and Teddy Kolek. It is this faith in the Jewish people that took me to become a member of Knesset, a minister, a speaker of the Knesset, uh, the Knesset, the shrine of democracy, and I did everything in order to show everyone that the Knesset is the shrine of democracy, where arguments and disagreements should be, and I pray to God, will always be Leshem Shamaim Letovata Am, for the good of all the people in Israel. And all the citizens of Israel, whether they are Christian, Muslims, or Jews, in the Jewish state that could be never changed. And all the country. And it is the faith that I took with me into the office of the President of Israel uh, at the time. Friends, as President, I worked from day one to do everything to bridge the gaps between the different communities, uh, the different tribes of Israel. Because I know, just like Herzl did, what great potential this nation has. We cannot ignore the fact that in Israel today, we live in four tribes. In my famous speech at the University of Herzliya, I made it very clear. And uh, I, say, I brought it as a clear warning about the danger of hatred and division in the society because our country is a little bit changing. Today, according to the CBS of Israel, we find that the first uh, few uh, grades in school, we are 25% students, 25% from the Israeli Arab side. Israeli Arabs are 25% once we are talking about the four grades of school. We have 25 or almost 25% of the Haredim in Israel. And they are filling schools in the four grades, the first four grades, um, each one of them. We have 38, uh, 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 we have 38 uh, uh, seculars, and we have 12% national religious. And everyone, every one of them lives alone. Leave and let leave, they say, but from time to time, we are facing a lot of gaps that are growing every day more and more. We also know, especially in these days, when there is more and more anti-Semitism in the world, that we are actually 
five tribes with the Jewish communities all over the world. This tribe and all the other tribes in Israel are very lucky. They are very lucky to have the World Jewish Congress on. And Ambassador Ronald uh, Lauder as the president. You, Ronald, and your dear wife, Joe Carroll, who, who you are so dear to us in Jerusalem because you did so much for the spirit of Jerusalem and for the culture of Jerusalem. God bless you as a Jerusalemite. And the Safra family who were much before the Rivlin family have, re have returned back to Jerusalem after um, the year 1809 because uh, the uh, Vilna Gaon have said to us, why do you pray three times a day to God that with his mercy he will return us to back to Jerusalem? Let's go to Jerusalem. Everything is open. We can go there. And we went there. And since then, we are there. And the Safa family came before us at about 10 or 12 generations before that. So we were Olim Chadashim at the time. President Navon always said to me, you are Ole Chadash. You, Ronald, and your dear wife have made such great contribution to the Jewish people. You have helped in Jewish communities all over the world. And I watched you and I was with you, whether we were in Odessa or other places in Ukraine and other places all around the world. But also in countries where Israel does not have diplomatic relationship. As president of the World Jewish Congress for over 15 years, God bless you, I have problems with the light and with the papers. You have established more than 30 Jewish schools in Europe, centers of help, employment in the Negev and in the Galil in Israel. And we don't forget that, and we appreciate that very much. You are helping build the future of the Jewish people and the Jewish state. Thank you, thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. Dear friends, when I think about the future of our country, one week after the election, you know, we have a lot of holidays. We have Rosh Hashanah, we have Yom Kippur, we have Sukkot, we have Simchat Torah, we have Hanukkah, we have Tubishvat, we have Purim, we have Pesach, we have Shavuot, but more than holidays, we have elections in Israel. <laughs> and one week after the election, we are in the very days when we are trying, trying once again to build a government according to the democratic will of the people. I have some experience in this, in fact. In the last five years, I hold the record for giving the uh, most uh, presidential mandates uh, to form a government to several politicians in Israel. And it, I, I'm still after being a president, so I'm not talking politics. And it is not a record to be proud of, must admit. In light of the election results, this time we have a winner, a winner of the election. But we all have to be very careful. I can only express my very sincere hope that the new government will offer the people of Israel stability. We need stability, economic and social growth. And we'll know to keep us safe in the many challenges that we are facing. This is what, is, is, this is what it may, means to, to be sovereign nation. And just as Herzl said, the rest 
we will manage for ourselves. We can never, we can never allow the security of our Jewish people and all the Jewish people all around the world to be in the hands of others. And we can never avoid our responsibility to the democratic and Jewish foundations of our state. And a word to the Palestinians. We are all neighbors. We, I, as the Rivlin, a member of the, of the Rivlin family, have lived since 1809 with all the Bani el Balad, which means the sons of Jerusalem, and we managed to do it until 1936, but actually we are already for 150 years in a real clash, clash with the, the Palestinians. You have to know, President Abbas, we are not doomed to live together. Our destiny is to live together. But you have to get into the idea and to accept the idea that the Jewish people have returned back to their only homeland. We have to build, of course, to build a, a responsibility and to build exception and uh, really uh, to trust each other. We have to build trust, but it is about time. We are already in war for more than 100 years. So let's find a way in order to talk one to each other and to know that this is for the best wishes and the best interests of, of all of us. So please, <laughs> listen to us. We are, the, we are here and you are here. We have to learn how to live together. It is very difficult and we, once upon a time we will talk about these difficulties. Throughout my life in public service, I hope that I stood up to these important values. And so it is with great honor I accept, I accept with all my heart, and really I thank you so very much for this award this evening. Thank you very much. Performing somewhere over the rainbow, please enjoy the pupils of the Tallinn Jewish School at the Lauder Education Hub in Tallinn, Estonia.
We will now begin the presentation of the World Jewish Congress Teddy Kollek Award for the Advancement of Jewish Culture with a special message from former United States Secretary of State, Dr. Henry Kissinger. I would like to thank Ron Lauder and the World Jewish Congress to give me, for giving me an opportunity to say a few words about Ken Burns's video on America and the Jewish emigration during the Hitler period. It means particularly much to me because I was one of the individuals fortunate enough to be received by America. My whole family emigrated in 1938, two months before the doors closed due to the physical violence done to the Jewish population. But the situation became untenable for Jews living in Germany after the 1938 burning of all synagogues and other centers where Jewish culture and religion could be expressed. Ken Burns has made a significant contribution by showing the impact of the limitations on Jewish emigration. In one particular case, the ship St. Louis that it included that a large number of individuals without entry visas into the United States. And in the absence of landing authority in America, all the passengers were returned to Germany where they suffered the general fate of the Jewish population. It was a tragedy and the human suffering involved cannot be exaggerated. At the same time, while there may have been an element of anti-Semitism involved, I'm bound to say as one of the beneficiaries of American policy permitted to enter the United States that the fate of the St. Louis was an aberration. But what we learn from this experience and what Ken Burns has shown us so graphically is that the human impact of decisions and challenges needs to be taken into consideration by the 
by the United States when suddenly emergencies arise. So Ken Burns has done his usual extraordinary job in describing a des desperate period. And being familiar myself with so many victims of that period, the refusal to permit the passengers of St. Louis and the limitations that were imposed by rigid execution of existing laws must be remembered with pain and with the determination to be more open in the face of undoubted tragedy. So let me thank the World Jewish Congress to say these words and to congratulate Ken Burns on his artistic achievement. Thank you. It's now my honor to ask Ken Burns to please come up and accept the award, the Teddy Kollek Award for his film, The U.S. and the Holocaust. I must tell you, it's an amazing film. Thank you. Thank you for what you did. I have no idea. Thank you. And this is a Teddy Kalik Award. Thank you. Thank you. Equally heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to the World Jewish Congress. Thank you to Dr. Kissinger for his very, very kind words. And a very special thanks to my good friends um, and tremendous philanthropist and citizen, really, of the world, uh, WJC President Ronald Lauder, and, of course, the power behind him, Joe Carroll. Thank you so much. <laughs> President Rivlin, it is an honor to stand in the same room with you tonight. Congratulations to you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. I am a filmmaker. The stories I explore are about history, mostly American history. With each film, I am reminded of Ecclesiastes, the extraordinary book from the Hebrew Bible. Ecclesiastes tells us that what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. The great American novelist Thomas Wolfe said of Ecclesiastes, of all I have ever seen or learned, that book seems to me the noblest, the wisest, and the most powerful expression of man's life upon this earth, and also the highest flower of poetry, eloquence, and truth. Why is it that we must confront the belief, however poetically, express that we might be doomed to repeat our failures, that human nature, as Ecclesiastes implies, never changes. Does that lead to a deep pessimism or despair? Do we find in these holy words a sense of hope, a recognition that we are all, in fact, human beings, as you said, Mr. President, bound together by the frailty of our shared humanness, that we are, in fact, capable, perhaps, of changing. 
Mark Twain, one of our country's greatest writers, is supposed to have said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. If he did in fact say it, I think he was right. It is in those rhymes, good and bad, beautiful and ugly, that we can find out who we are as a people. We realize that the choices we make, the freedom to choose how to live our lives, what values we embody is a moral one, both for you, your family, and friends, but also for governments and societies at large. I was never fortunate enough to meet Teddy Kollek, but I have known about him all of my life. And when I think of Jerusalem, I think of his multiple terms as mayor, his love for the city and its people, and his commitment to faith, culture, and the arts as a crossroads where we can all come together, regardless of our own backgrounds. I believe that history is very much one of those crossroads. Just history is contentious. Stories about the past are often at odds with our memory, and we do not today have a monopoly on hatred. It has been part of every culture, all of our histories. But there is solace in facts, in truth, in confronting our most painful moments. As you know, we just broadcast our most recent film, The U.S. and the Holocaust, co-directed with my longtime colleagues, Lynn Novick and Sarah Botstein. The reaction to it has been truly extraordinary. Most of all, I've been struck by how many people, even those who think they know this history, have come up to me and said, I had no idea. I will not work, ladies and gentlemen, on a more important film in my life. America, of course, was not responsible for the Holocaust, but in our eagerness to tell the story of what we did to end World War II, we failed as a country to reckon with what we didn't do and why. Why were so few Jews of the hundreds and hundreds of thousands who were attempting to flee Nazi terror not allowed or so few allowed into the United States? Why was there so much support for Nazism here, so much anti-Semitism here, even among our most celebrated countrymen, an anti-Semitism that afflicts us and confounds us today, today? What is the connection between racism and anti-Semitism, and how did they influence our public policy, even at the highest levels of our government? What can we learn from this story to help us with the challenges we face now? How do we strengthen our democracy? Deborah Lipstadt in our film says the time to stop a genocide is before it happens. The time, of course, to save a democracy is before it's lost. We are at a different and ominous crossroads now, and history doesn't provide us with easy answers to point us down the right path. But it does allow us to pose better questions, to explore how those who came before us dealt with similar issues. History gives us the gift of perspective and the opportunity for learning the self-reflection and righteous actions necessary. Abraham Lincoln, our greatest president, who shares with Ecclesiastes a spiritual genius for language, asked in his first inaugural that his countrymen follow, in his words, the better angels of our nature, that as a nation we should remember and celebrate the mystic cords of memory that bounds us, not by ropes, not cords of ropes, but celestial harmony, C-H-O-R-D-S, together regardless of differences. But his America would, within weeks of that speech, be torn apart by a bloody civil war, a civil war that in many ways we are still fighting today, that haunts us and threatens our present moment still. But Lincoln was asking all of us, I believe, even so many years later, to find what we have in common, to find the us in the US and to try to build on that. Mayor Kollek said, if you want one simple word to symbolize all of Jewish history, that word would be Jerusalem.
He was, of course, referring to the outsized role that city plays in the story of mankind, a crossroads of unending importance. Perhaps just for a moment this evening, we could also celebrate another crossroads cities, this one of two words, New York, a city where, for a while, more Jewish people lived than in any other city on Earth. I live and work now in a small village in New Hampshire, but I like to remind people that I was born in Brooklyn, where my two grown daughters live with their families today. New York City has always been a part of my life. It infuses so much of what I do. For me, much of that has to do with Jewish culture. The writers and artists who have contributed to the vibrancy of this city, and by extension, this country, and indeed, the entire world. I like to think that Mayor Colick was referring to the power of cities to inspire us, a power that asks us to be civilized, not tribal, because cities bring all kinds of people together. They are the physical manifestation of civilization. Even, even when we are divided, they force us to acknowledge inevitable difficulty and challenge us always to do better. They are places where we strive to find our shared values, our better angels. I cannot think of a greater honor than this extraordinary recognition named after this amazing individual. I am so grateful and deeply humbled. I will cherish this evening and this award. Thank you so much. Wow. I must tell you, this is the 11th or 12th awards, and I must tell you, I've never heard better speeches than Lou Rivlin and Ken Burns. Bravo to you. And before we go to dinner, I always end this with something I hold dear. And that is the children of my schools singing Hatikva. So please, please rise.
Oh, oh, oh. 